If we could then, I'll turn to Kevin, to Gary's right. Uh, so Kevin, again, I, I'll open the same question, please. Take a few minutes, perhaps up to 10. Introduce yourself and key elements of your work, please. Sure, thank you. It's really a joy for, for me to, to be here and to welcome the competition. Uh, and, 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 and I'll explain that. That's inside baseball for higher education, but I'll, I'll explain it. Um, what you've heard from, from Carla is um, the U.S. Institute of Peace devoted to advising on policy and training and bringing together uh, academics and uh, NGOs, uh, interfacing with government. And what you heard from Gary was peace building and development, because you can't have peace if you have water instability. The, the fundamental of human security, one could argue, is potable water. So the frame that I want to take, because I'm the only unreconstructed academic on this panel, is I want to talk a little bit about the field as it developed in the academy uh, and why I'm so happy to welcome the school to the competitive market, in a way of aiming for the best students and turning out the best PhDs, because it's great if Mason can hire the best PhDs from Kennesaw State. Um, when I came to, and, and also because there are interesting parallels between George Mason and, and Kennesaw, uh, both began as very small regional universities uh, both began as universities in the shadow of other great universities in Virginia, Mr. Jefferson's University, and so on, and in Georgia, uh, Emory, and Georgia Tech, and so on. And that has a lot to do with why we became the first uh, academic entity on the planet to offer a master's degree in 1980, 1981 in conflict resolution. We were the first. When I came to Mason, uh, as a young assistant professor of anthropology in 1979, the most interesting group of colleagues on a very small campus, maybe 9,000 uh, students, were a group of individuals from the social sciences who were trying to imagine what a field of conflict management or conflict resolution would look like. They came from sociology and political science and public affairs and communication and anthropology and sociology. And they came together because a really remarkable group of outsiders, this actually ties in with the history of the US Institute of Peace because it was all happening around the same time in interesting ways. And with the development of ADR as a social movement, a group of outsiders came to the pr president of, of the young and small university um, and said, you know, there may be one day a peace academy built, and if Mason were entrepreneurial and got ahead and developed the first master's degree, maybe the, the, the brick and mortar peace academy would locate itself at Mason. In the event it didn't, it gave rise to the U.S. Institute of Peace. The folks who came to us were individuals who uh, came from the diplomatic world, uh, from the world of public policy, uh, from the world of, of uh, crisis negotiation, um, f and they, they, they came with this idea and they excited a bunch of faculty about it. Uh, the president of the university had nothing to lose because we were a young university. It would be a while before the political economy of Richmond would allow us to develop master's degrees in the traditional discipline. So sure, why not? Why not put together a master's degree in conflict resolution? And so we did. And um, what we realized was in some ways we had to invent the field as a field to research and to teach. Now, of course there were islands of theory, but they were very much siloed. They were siloed in game theory. They were siloed in labor management relations. They were siloed in in uh, negotiation theory. They were siloed, of course, in, in international re relations, you know, Fred Ickley and how wars end. Uh, but there was not a sense 
that one could separate methodologies tied to disciplines or disciplines themselves and consider conflict, particularly violent conflict, as the problematic. And to try and you know, not make the foolish uh, uh, assertion that marital conflict and international conflict are the same thing, but to understand that the dynamics of conflict, escal uh, escalation, sunk costs, cognitive distortions, autistic hostility, those things which you can find in a relationship or a marriage that is falling apart, you could also find in the relations between ethnic or racial groups in a society and indeed nation states. So we were the first group on the planet to have the master's degree and uh, we were borrowing from the extant literatures that existed, negotiation theory and so forth, game theory, but we were really trying to create a coherent curriculum. And I have to tell you, in those first few years, as master's cohorts entered, the curriculum changed every year, every two, two years. We were experimenting on these people. In fact, I have often reflected if we were doing, in a medical setting, what we were doing in university, we'd all be in jail. Um, but we moved ahead. And in some cases, we even realized that there were gaps or lacuna in the literature that we then had to write in order to teach the field. So we looked around, and there was not a whole lot on cultural difference. Because if you were a nation state political scientist, that didn't matter. If you were a social psychologist interested in negotiation, culture was, was off, off the table. There weren't a whole lot of people writing about gender. And so colleagues began to say, well, so we, so we, we need to do work in that area. And as Tim said, my, my own work, um, uh, helped by a uh, Jennings Randolph Fellowship at the U.S. Institute of Peace in 1996-97, was to take the sensibility of a cultural anthropologist and try to apply that to theorizing about conflict and conflict resolution. So we were lucky to attract the uh, attention of the Hewlett Foundation, which funded conflict resolution for about 20 years, between 1984 and 2004, when it moved on to other areas, as foundations will. And the interesting thing was we were the least prestigious university to get Hewlett Foundation support. It was Stanford, it was Harvard, it was Michigan. But we, we, we came to them and we said, uh, our goal is to build an academic field to educate students, send them off into the world. We're not going to compete with Harvard on the way the law school and the program on negotiation and the, the Fletcher School and MIT can do. We will do something very different. And we did. And interestingly, we were among the last programs in 2004 that Hewlett funded because they said you were one of the few programs that did what you said you do. And part of the reason for that is, oh, uh, we were the least prestigious and therefore, uh, unlike some uh, more prestigious universities, we took the money seriously and didn't use it for something else. We actually did what we were given money to do. In 1988, we offered the first PhD on the planet in the field because we felt that we were uh, at the point, having experimented on cohorts of master's students, that we had a curriculum uh, that we could offer at the doctoral level. In the meantime, we were uh, adding faculty from a variety of social science disciplines, and we made it our special mission to uh, try and attract and sustain and support students, both masters and PhD, from areas saturated with conflict. Because the hope was really a kind of missionary hope. The hope was that these students would go off into the world, go back to their countries in many cases, and take what we could teach them and adapt it to the dynamics of conflict in their own context and do good, or at least try not to do harm. We knew that we couldn't teach someone from Somalia more about conflict in Somalia than they already knew. In fact, in many cases that they already lived through. 
What we did know as social scientists, essentially, was that we could teach them what conflict and peace processes and negotiation looked like in Northern Ireland, or in Colombia, or in South Africa. That we could take folks who were so saturated by their own troubles, by their own conflicts, often by the things that they had witnessed, that even looking at the peace process in Northern Ireland, seeing how long it took, what the dynamics were, how important it was that, that uh, uh, President Clinton overruled his State Department and got Jerry Adams a visa to come to the US and talk to American Irish, all those things that had to fall into place for a 15, 16 year peace process to work in Northern Ireland. And when folks saw that, they began to see their own conflict in, in, to me in what social science does best, which is in a comparative perspective, in a correlative, if not causal, perspective, and, and, and so on. And indeed, we now have about 1,800 alumni around the world, and uh, many of them are doing amazing things. Many of them came to us having already worked in human rights and gender equality and civil society in places where it took a lot of courage to do that. More courage than most of my faculty colleagues, including myself, had. And we sent them back. And in some cases, uh, myself and my predecessors had to get on the phone to embassies and try to get them out of jail. Only in 2004 and 2005 did we add the BA and the BS degree. So this is a little inside academic baseball, but we did it backwards. We started not with the undergraduate degree and then we moved outwards to the PhD. We started with the master's degree quickly with the PhD and then only when the faculty thought that there really was a field, there really was a curriculum, there really were journals, several of which are here. There really were individuals working in other places that we could offer a major, a concentration in conflict analysis and resolution. Why did we wait that long? Well, because the faculty thought that there was a, that, that, that there was a different moral responsibility to teaching 18 and 19 year olds. And that we really wanted to be sure that there was a field and that they weren't just getting down, getting watered down political science or watered down social psychology. That, that, that there was something different there. So when I say that it is really joyous for me to come and see the school come into existence, I, I say it for self, uh, self evidently selfish reasons. Because I do think I was one of the people who happened to be in the right place, in the right time, who was able to uh, help to, to, to bring the field into academic existence. You know, in 1981, we were the only master's program in conflict resolution or conflict management, right, dispute resolution in the world. Today, there are over 100 master's programs in North America. But there are still only a handful of schools that have some autonomy as to who they hire, who they promote, who they admit, who they tenure, and who can bring together master's, PhD, and you all have certificates in undergraduate education too, who can be really a full service entity. And that's important because when a master's program is shoehorned into a department of political science or into a department of psychology, and by the way, those came into existence because of student demands. Students demanded that their political science and social psychology and communications professors address peace and conflict resolution. And you know, they said, yeah, okay, we'll have a concentration, we'll have a master's in it. That's not how the field grows. The field grows when there are independent schools whose self, and I think Professor Adebayo said it, said it brilliantly, whose self-conception, whose sensibility is built around imagining what the field is. And that's what we did, and we could do it because we were a small, unprestigious, regional university that had nothing to lose. Wouldn't have happened at the University of Chicago. 
wouldn't have happened in traditional universities where the chairs of the social science departments were like barons and the dead hand of tradition lay upon what political science or international relations had to be. In a way, it could only happen at schools like Mason and at schools in many ways like Kennesaw State now, which is moving beyond being a regional university, well beyond being a regional university. So Great. when I say that oh. I'm, 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 Ke Kevin, I'm, Kevin, yeah, can you can you wind up in thirty seconds? I'm wound up. Oh my God, I'm done. <laughs> Skillfully done, thank you. <laughs>